For those of you who don't know, my name is Jeremy Fioravanti. I'm the president of the Delaware County Institute of Science. My professional affiliation is with the Harrisburg Area Community College, HACC. I'd like to welcome you to uh, our last Zoom session of the winter lecture series and our second successful year of reaching out through the Zoom medium for bringing scientists to come uh, speak with the membership of the Institute. Uh, this is no small feat for uh, all volunteer organization that was founded in 1833 with a new quote unquote building uh, from 1867 in the, the heart of downtown media, Pennsylvania. Uh, many of you, I see your names and I recognize them, uh, but if you are new, I want to encourage you to become members, get involved as volunteers, donate your time, efforts, uh, intellectual capacity to help sustain our organization. I'd like to thank Dr. Laura Gurton of Penn State for this lecture and Dr. Uh, Dan King with Drexel University for providing uh, technical support. Um, just to remind you that we do have our next lecture in March, that'll be March 13th. It will be in person at the Delaware County Institute of Science uh, with Dr. Eric Jensen of Swarthmore College on the topic of astronomy. Uh, this year, we won't be able to get Zoom and in-person going at the same time, but we have plans to try to do something uh, just like that. Um, so Dr. Gurton, would you please introduce our speaker? Thank you very much, Jeremiah. And I am thrilled to introduce not just someone I would consider a colleague, but a good friend. And that's what happens after you spend two months on the ocean together. So perhaps you caught the DCIS webinar back in May of this year. And if, Dan, if you can drop that URL into the chat. I was out to sea for a two month ocean research expedition on the scientific research vessel Joides Resolution. And I zoomed back to from the South Atlantic Ocean to Media, Pennsylvania, in offering a virtual tour of the ship and a chance to speak with the scientists on board. And one of those scientists happened to be Dr. Claire Routledge, and she spoke to us about micropaleontology and her work with nanofossils on the ship. And Jeremia was so inspired by the presentation she gave on the ship that he invited her to join us here today. And I'm thrilled to be able to give Dr. Routledge this platform to be able to share some of her really exciting work, especially considering uh, the time zone she is in. She is, and she's gonna go over her background for you in a sec. She's at University of Kiel in Germany. So it is very early morning or late night time for her, but she is staying up to, to share uh, her research and expertise with us. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and toss it over to you, Claire, so you can get started. Awesome, thank you, Lauren, Jeremiah, and thank you all for um, coming to my lecture, I suppose. Um, and I'm really honored to have been asked to give a talk. So I will um, go ahead and share my screen. Oops, I need to do this. And, Listen. Okay. Oh, I'm at the I'm at the wrong end. Sorry. <laughs> and I've had sorry, I've had a few um, internet issues this morning or this evening rather. So I'm going to just turn my camera off um, for now, just to make sure I don't uh, lose you all. But I'm still here. So I wanted to introduce you to a little bit more of, as Laura mentioned, um, we talked on the Joides um, about how plankton is used um, on the boat. And then I wanted to give a bit more indication of how we use that post um, post recovery. So um, my, the title of this sort of talk is A Climate and Ocean Record from Plankton to Fossils. And I am based at the University of Kiel in, um, in Germany. So with that, uh, looking at climate and past climate. So um, the theme of, of the talk today really is the past is a key to the future. And um, to start that off, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an uh, indication about my background, um, some information about my background. So I grew up in Auckland in New Zealand, um, where I spent most of my childhood and then traveled, not by bike, but for a cycling scholarship, I ended up um, in Texas for my undergraduate, where I did a, a Bachelor of Science in Geology, and then moved to Florida State University for my master's, which I finished in 2015. Um, and then from there, I moved to the UK to London to complete my PhD at University College London. 
and finished that at the end of 2021. So it was a rough year to write up during um, the COVID pandemic, but thankfully um, managed to keep focused and get done. And I moved to Kiel in Northern Germany um, at the beginning of last year as a postdoctoral researcher um, in the Institute of Geosciences. And yeah, so this is a little bit more about my background and um, yeah, I'll move on now. So what I I guess I'd like to move on from what I call the recent past, which is sort of my history into the geologic past. So we're talking from years into millennia. And so climate in general, um, climate has changed on sort of varying timescales since the world um, first evolved four and a half billion years ago. So with um, climate itself is controlled by many things and mostly it's the, the greenhouse effect. So that's the incoming solar radiation from the sun and some of it is absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere and trapped. So things like carbon dioxide um, emissions and they're um, in the atmosphere and, and helping to keep our, our climate warm, but also have sort of negative impacts. So the Cenozoic itself uh, refers to the last 66 million years of time. And this is from when essentially the dinosaurs went extinct. And so this graph shows you the time. Um, so time here is on the x-axis uh, where the most recent time um, to the right. And uh, this is an indication of uh, deep ocean temperature. So this is kind of showing you for the last um, 60 million years how temperature has changed. This is just something to bear in mind. And we are obviously down here now. So although we're going through these really um, intense warming periods, warming time at the moment, um, we have lived through, well, sorry, we haven't lived through, the earth has experienced much warmer times, even in our um, more recent uh, past. And so this figure is another demonstration of um, climate uh, measured by isotopes from the shells of um, benthic foraminifera. So these are um, organisms that are living in, on the sea floor. And so it's the same, same as before, time is um, younger, younger to the right. And the points here that I just wanted to highlight, these points um, to the far right over here, um, are demonstrating uh, future climate projections for global temperature um, in the year 2300. So with different, different representative um, concentration pathways uh, determined by the IPCC report. So essentially what is likely to happen if um, climate continues to, uh, to warm as it is, and at different rates. So if we don't control our CO2 emissions, we are likely to get back to um, intense, we could potentially reach climates, um, you know, close to what we had uh, maybe 50, 60 million years ago. So the question is, how do we generate climate records? How do we get such lovely long records of climate? And so there are many different ways and um, each operate on different timescales. So from human measurements like, um, you're outside with your weather, your personal weather station, um, to something like tree rings and ice cores, which ice cores are only as good as for when we have ice. Um, uh, lake sediments, again, we need uh, lakes to be around for a really long time to record um, this sort of time scale. Um, so the best records of long-term time are actually long-term climate rather actually come from the ocean sediments and so uh, this sort of leads me into how we recover these cores. This is from the advent of scientific ocean drilling. So this is the uh, Joides resolution at port somewhere beautiful a few years ago um, and deep sea drilling first started in the, in the late 1960s um, and we've had several iterations of international ocean drilling um, to the latest uh, program, the International Ocean Discovery Program, which um, I have been fortunate enough to sail on twice um, and which I met Laura on um, last year sailing in the South Atlantic. So some of these things that we've been able to achieve through scientific ocean drilling includes um, proving the theory of plate tectonics, and that actually has a really close link to um, our expedition last year. So they were also able to confirm the presence of evaporites in the Mediterranean, so these really big um, salt domes. And also we recovered, we have recovered um, direct evidence of the um, Cretaceous Paleogene um, mass extinction, the bolide impact um, that caused the loss of you know, much flora and fauna and, and, and most notably the dinosaurs. 
So this is a map of all of the, um, it's showing you the global spread of um, ocean drilling sites. And the this in the one in green in 2015, this is the Arabian Sea Monsoon Expedition. This was my first expedition on board the Joides and we were drilling into the Indus fan. So that was everything, not everything, a lot of sediment that was being um, eroded from the Himalaya. So we were looking at how, um, how the Himalaya, how the uplift of the Himalaya has affected climate, and then um, most importantly, there how it was influencing the monsoon in in um, in that part of the world. And then this was from I think it was March to April, March to June, March to April last year. Goodness, it feels like so long ago already. Oh, April to June. There we go. Um, two months at sea in the South Atlantic, where we were uh, drilling along the Mid Atlantic Ridge. At different at different age crust to um, to study various uh, different um, geologic processes from ocean circulation and climate um, to looking at the rate of spreading and the cooling as well as the microbial interactions um, from the deep sea into the into the earth's crust. So I wanted to give you a bit of an indication of how um, the process of coring actually works aboard the Joy. So this is a photo from. Uh, the catwalk is actually a video. And so what happens is the engineers start drilling. We have um, a 10 meter, each core that comes up is 10 meters long. Um, the technicians, the technicians bring the core from the, um, from the floor onto the catwalk and it gets cut into sections of one and a half meters, as you can see them diligently working on now. And from this, the geochemists and the micropaleontologists will take samples and we run, um, these are a bunch of us that were getting ready to receive the first samples. Um, and we run things like, uh, we, the paleontologists are looking to determine the age of the sediment. So that's that was my primary goal on the boat last year was to every sample that came up or every core that came up, I would take a sample and analyze it to look at the age. And this gives us a really good indication of where we are and what to expect. Um, and then we also have the geochemists who are tracking things like the levels of gas, because we are not um, a boat that is prepared or able to deal with um, oil and gas. So if anything, if we ever get to these um, unsafe levels we have to stop drilling and there are many many things many many seismics and other uh things that are done before we sail um to make sure that this is low risk but um it's important to have people checking these sorts of things anyway so the cores are split and in, into two halves one gets stored away and the other one is analyzed by the sedimentologists who describe the cores um both at the macro scale and the micro. So we're looking at it and then looking at the sediment, the colors, and then the um, they'll take a sample and look at the different lithologies under the microscope. Um, magnetostrigophers will also take samples um, to determine whether the polarity of the sediment, and that also helps us to construct a really good age model for um, each site. So after that, the cores are wrapped and then they're stored for sampling post-cruise. And it was just um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, that the cores that we recovered in um, in April last year were sampled here in Germany. So we all put together our research proposal and um, got together as a, uh, I think there were maybe 25 of us that were sampling um, all the cores for each, all the samples for each other. Um, and then they were sent off to, to do our respective work. So a few different, a few examples of the same sort of image. So this was me in 2015, my first uh, core, obviously very interesting. And then the same again in 2022. So seven years apart, but I'm still as fascinated with a bowl of mud that I'm presented with. And um, this is also an image of um, us giving back a little bit more as well, giving um, talks to, uh, I think this was a, this is when we got back in port and I think it was one of the universities um, that I do some work with. So it's really fun to be able to connect with, with people um, from the ship um, on shore as well. I mean, as I think maybe some of you might have been there last year. So how this is done. So the cores are, um, there are different types of coring systems depending on the type of material and the depth that they're at. Um, and this is essentially what we're looking for. 
So all the, the, not looking for, this is what we get back. So these, this is an example of um, cores from the um, Izubone and Mariana Trench. So up in just off the coast of Japan or close to Japan. And um, you can see how the lithology of the uh, material changes through time. So this is the older stuff down the bottom and then we've got younger material um, at the top. And so different scientists on the boat will be interested in different um, different aspects of the material. And this is how uh, we all come together to try and build a really good story using all of the all of the material that we have at hand. And another example of one of the expeditions where they were able to recover um, direct evidence of the um, Cretaceous Paleogene uh, bolide impact, meteorite impact. So you can see this is before the impact to the right, um, various different indicators of what is going on as the meteorite is hit, and then um, life returning or trying to return to some sort of normalcy um, post impact. And a little look at what we recovered. This is just uh, one of the last cores, actually. We're having a little bit of fun here because. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Um, this is the bottom of one of the short holes and um, they can see the sediment to basement interface here. So this is the um, this is a hard rock that some of the um, petrologists were more interested in looking at. And I am very much more interested in this, um, this carbonate sediment. And um, when we're on the boat, we can take uh, discrete samples if we need to get a higher resolution or if we have a reason to um, want to sample a little bit more. And to do that, we put a little flag in with our respective um, lab groups. And this will be approved or declined or denied um, based on various different reasons by our sample allocation committee, which includes um, the, the curator of the cores and our co-chiefs and staff scientists. They'll make sure that nobody is requesting too much or being unreasonable with the requests or that we are um, maybe trying to save some of that material for post-cruise research if we can get um, some better results. But you can see here, there was a little sample that was taken and then you just fill it with um, some styrofoam or polystyrene um, to keep the shape of the, of the sediment so that we not, um, it's not collapsing on each other. And I just wanted to show you um, one of the processes of, process, yeah, so when you're trying to re-enter the hole, if you have to change the, the bit at the bottom of the drill bit, at the bottom of the drill string, um, this is some really cool footage of there's a camera that they use to help um, direct the drill string, which is what you can see at the top. And then some of the life that uh, sea life that they've seen on a court on the camera. So I just thought it was a nice, cute video to show you all the little interesting creatures that are maybe as interested in us as we are in them, but um, they're not being <laughs> drilled at this stage. And this was a process of, we were taking water samples. So um, what I study as calcareous nanofossils or nanoplankton, if when they're alive, and they live in the upper um, upper layers of the water column. And, oops, and, um, play again. and we were just taking samples on our transit back to, um, back to Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, and I'm going to do some analysis on the plankton assemblage. So just looking at what's living in the oceans currently and whether that, how different that is and, and what we can gather from that um, in comparison to the past and other areas. So this all leads into what we're looking for in the cores. So um, the modern eukaryotic phytoplankton sort of comprises three main algal groups and the diatoms, the coccolithophores, which is what I study, and dinoflagellates. So uh, coccolithophores or calcareous nanoplankton, nanos, nanoplankton, nanofossils for short, it all sort of work, works. Um, they are a subset of haptophyte algae. They measure sort of they're less microscopic in size and they're um, they're living in the photic zone of the ocean, so the upper 200 meters generally. And they evolved many millions of years ago in the late Triassic. So they are major constituents of deep sea oozes. So when the organism itself um, dies, it sink, the shell will sink to the sea floor and these are then preserved in the ocean sediments. And that's what we are drilling to recover. 
So I'll show you here, this is an individual coccolith, um, and you can see it in the middle here, and that forms, they form a coccosphere. So as the organism dies, often this breaks apart because they're quite delicate. Um, and I have a, another photo of a different coccus, we call these a coccosphere when they all form together. And, and another, um, this is from a scanning electron microscope, so it's different resolution. Um, and this is measures about 0.1 millimeter across. So they're, you can tell they're really, really small. Um, and this is just a, an assemblage of mostly one um, species. And these have been rec recovered in, in, the, in the sediments of the ocean. And if anyone is familiar with the white cliffs of Dover or any of the cliffs, white cliffs on the south coast of um, England, these are chalk cliffs, cliffs, and they are majority comprised of, 90% um, I would say comprised of fossil coccoliths. So uh, it's quite um, impressive when you consider the size of them that they can form these gigantic cliffs. So yeah, just again, showing you what it is that's forming these, these cliffs. And not only that, but you can see these from space. So um, this is the south coast of England, and we've got Cornwall to the left and um, the south coast in Sussex. And this is um, a Landsat image. And the big white blooms are a phytoplankton bloom. And so this is um, this species generally. Um, it's a very cosmopolitan, um, modern taxa. So it's very well known and they, bloom in certain conditions, but it's just outrageous that you can see them from space when they measure such small, um, and when they're such small size. And again, this is um, the Black Sea, uh, and you can see these, um, the swirling in, in here, that's also phytoplankton um, blooming here. So I think it's just a nice image to put into perspective what we're looking at um, and how you can see it from space. And um, I have a video here of a coccolith being extruded from the inside of the shell of the inside of the organism. And so it pops, it forms this, uh, the coccolith from the inside, and then it is extruded outside and they join together. Um, eventually these will all, these lith, individual liths will form together to, to sort of cover the entire um, nucleus and will form a sphere or a coccosphere. So this was a uh, video from a culture study in the lab. So um, pretty, pretty nifty, I think. And if anyone's familiar with planktic foraminifera, um, this was an image taken um, on the expedition last year by um, a colleague. And you can see the on the left is a planktic foraminifera and on the right is a calcareous nanoplankton. And you can just, it's, sort of just indicating again the size even between um, other micro paleontological um, organisms. There we go. So uh, what do calcareous nanoplankton do and what are used for? So they are actually great biostratigraphic markers. So that means they give us an indication of age in the sediment um, due to their small size the wide geographic range, they evolve rapidly. Um, and because they're so small, you only need a small um, sample size to get a really good um, a really good indication of the age of the sediment. Um, they are most diverse in warm oligotrophic gyres, so where there's not too much nutrients. Um, and they're also very sensitive to paleoenvironmental changes. So we can use them to reconstruct um, surface water environments in the past, um, as well as like past climate. And there are three main types of, three main groups rather of um, coccoliths. So we've got the heterococcoliths, which are um, organisms that are made up of crystals in different size and shapes, and they form um, together, to, they, they form the coccosphere. Uh, we've got holococcoliths, which often look quite unique. Um, they have a sort of um, hexagon sort of structure. The, uh, it looks like honeycomb sometimes. Um, so these individual crystal units are all the same size and shape, and uh, they are really, really delicate. So they're not often preserved in the sediment because they are just um, either they don't make it to the seafloor or they are 
broken up and destroyed once they reach the seafloor. So they're really rare to find in, in fossil um, records. And then we have something called the nanoliths, which are just a group of um, species which don't really fit into any one category particularly well. Um, and they have varying shapes and sizes um, and just look really unique. So uh, this is a this is a graph um, showing you the um, the diversity of diatoms, foraminifera, and nanofossils um, through the Cenozoic. So here we have uh, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary on the right, and present time is is on the left hand side of the graph, and diversity is just on the on the y axis. Um, so diversity has declined. Um, in nanofossils, which is the purple line, through uh, much of the of the Cenozoic, so they were devastated at the, uh, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. We we lost almost ninety percent of all taxa at this um, at this time, and they managed to recover where they reached peak um, Cenozoic diversity in the warmest time um, of the Cenozoic in the in the Middle Eocene, um, and then. As, as time has gone on since then, as climate has sort of cooled, um, obviously other factors are in play, but we've lost um, a lot of our diversity. So driven by a loss of um, warm water taxa and declining speciation rates. So um, as the nanoplankton diversity was decreasing through, um, through this time, uh, diatom diversity in this pink here uh, really increased, steadily increased, and this is expanding into niches that were sort of vacated by the nanofossils due to less favorable conditions, whether that's climate, um, nutrients, uh, there were, it was a combination of different factors. So um, the, I was going to talk to you a little bit about some of my research for my PhD um, and what I was aiming to do. So um, my plans were to uh, reconstruct and document the nanoplankton diversity and um, community structure from the late Paleogene, so from um, about from the yeah late Paleogene, so um, early Oligocene, into the just across the um, Paleogene Neogene boundary, and I'm trying to determine whether climate was playing a really significant role in plankton evolution, uh, the population variability of the assemblages, and the comp the composition of um, of the assemblage itself. And so I wanted to generate diversity in assemblage data at varying resolutions, so I could capture the small and large scale trends in diversity um, and really explore the relationship between the diversity, paleoecology, paleoclimate and paleoceanography. So looking at whether these responses are um, driven by climate and nutrient changes. And so to do this, I counted things that looked like this. So this is a picture um, of a field of view, which is just me looking down the microscope, and this is what I see. And I, my job is to count these um, in terms of, uh, and I group them by species, um, unless it's really unclear, and then I'll go to the, the genus level. So I have um, each sample, I will count, um, is it each sample? Yeah, there's about 30,000 nanos that are counted um, during our semi-quantitative counting. So I'm looking at about 300 uh, fields of view. So about 300 different ones of these. And I'm, yeah, it's it's a lot of work. So I've highlighted some of the same species in here. So you get an indication of what I'm looking at. So this is one species, um, Coccolithus pelagicus. Another species here in the green. And the blue, again, a reticular fenestra. So these are really common in my, in, my, um, in my research. And then in the light blue, again, these are all, these are the most abundant um, taxa, I mean, as you can see. So I hope this gives you sort of an indication of what I was looking at, what I was trying to do. And as I said, this one, this guy up here is a little bit blurry. I wasn't really able to get a good read on him. So I will just categorize him to the genus level, which I think he's, part of this genus. So to do, to achieve um, my aims and objectives, I was looking at an interval of time um, known as the Oligocene. 
which is right here. So this is a figure that you've seen before with climate, um, the oldest climate on the left and moving into more, more um, the recent time on the right. Um, and so the Oligocene is an interval from 34 to 23 million years ago. Um, and we're looking at global climate as measured by isotopes of um, the shells of foraminifera. And so this is a significant period of time because the Oligocene um, is bookended by two major glaciations. So we've got the earliest at the Oligocene, Eocene Oligocene boundary. Um, and this is the first evidence of ice house climates um, that we have. So we're talking um, large scale ice sheets on Antarctica. And so the Oligocene is an interval of sort of interest following this rapid climate change um, through the EOT, the Eocene Oligocene transition. Um, and it's characterized by the first appearance, like I said, of continental ice sheets on Antarctica and generally glu uh, cooler global temperatures, uh, uh, both on the marine and terrestrial realms. And so prior to this, Antarctica was vegetated. It looked very different to how we know it today. Um, and this interval was also um, significant, saw significant biotic change on land and in the oceans, um, with some major extinctions and compositional changes in the plankton um, we've, um, that's been already recorded. So these are some of the in key um, intervals that I was, or key things I was trying to look at, um, highlighted with the green arrows. So um, the I'm highlighting here the time of the, um, the interval of time that I'm looking at. So this graph is um, showing you, sorry, it's flipping back now. So we've got um, uh, zero million years, so recent to uh, the earlier Cenozoic on the right and the period of the Oligocene here. And on the bottom here is nanofossil diversity. And so I'm showing you, um, highlighting this because it's really in, in um, a time of, I guess, precipitous decline of nanofossil diversity since the time, um, since climate shift again with, yeah. So the Oligocene is also relatively understudied because um, within the interval itself, there's relatively few major climatic shifts, um, with the exception of what is bookending it. So the, the um, EOT transition, um, the beginning, and then the Oligocene Miocene is another interval of um, glaci glaciation. So we were trying to assess whether this declining global trend, as you can see in the in the nanofossil record here, um, is reflected in the long term nanoplankton record that we have produced. Um, so to do this, I was also fortunate enough to be able to um, integrate another record with an existing DAS set um, from about the middle Eocene, from this interval here, so about the middle Eocene um, through to the Oligocene. And so we're looking at, um, uh, we, we were able to generate a record that's 23 million years long at extremely high resolution. So we're talking 30,000 year resolution throughout the interval, which as you can imagine, was a significant number of um, samples that were looked at by me and a colleague, myself and a colleague. Um, and to do this, we needed some stratigraphically complete sections that were suitable for high resolution sampling. And so these came from an, um, an IODP expedition uh, to the North Atlantic. So we can see the area um, in the inset here on the left. And then I've starred here in yellow um, the sites that we use to complete um, this record. And this, this uh, location was significant and really important because um, the we were trying to retrieve sequences. We were aiming to retrieve um, sedimentary sequences that were uh, really stratigraphically complete and then that had very high sedimentation rates. And when you've got high sedimentation rates, that usually means that you've got um, better microfossil preservation because um, the microfossils are being are being deposited faster and there's more um, clay and other um, materials there that is um, that are preserving it. And it also means that we can get a higher resolution because you've got um, sample, you've got material coming down a lot faster interval. So at, at times, um, sedimentation rates here, so that's how quickly the sediment was being deposited, were, were up to 10 centimeters per thousand years, which doesn't sound very high, but if you think about the rest of the global ocean, generally uh, deep ocean sedimentation is on the order of one and a half to two centimeters per thousand years. So um, yeah, we were fortunate to have these really high um, sedimentation rates. So we were we recovered these unique 
really expanded um, Eocene to Miocene sedimentary successions um, and some intervals of really excellent microfossil preservation um, due to the high clay input and the rapid deposition. And we were able to describe um, several new species from this as well and extend the range of some taxa that hadn't previously been seen um, as young as they were identified uh, in, this, in, this, in this material. So um, this is, I'm just, as a sort of figure to show you the sites that we were looking at. So uh, younger, younger time on the left and oldest on the right for the interval that I was looking at for my PhD. And you've got the three different sites that we used to construct this record. And on the right hand side here, um, the different resolutions that we had. So um, unfortunately at one site, we had a little bit poorer preservation of the microfossils. And so we didn't go into such high, um, high resolutions there because we weren't getting the results that we needed. Um, but at certain intervals, including the oligocene Miocene transition and the Eocene oligocene transition, especially, um, we went down to um, oh, up to, I guess, 10,000 year resolution. So that's extremely high for such old records. And so um, these records were cap um, these records. We wanted to capture both the short and long term changes um, in the community structure. And that's why we that's why we were changing the resolution um, and try to evaluate the causes for these changes. So for example, um, whether changes that were in direct response to the abiotic or biotic factors. So um, in general, most paleoceanographic nanofossil research studies have focused on um, developing really short-term high resolution assemblage records. Um, and the lack of longer term records means that more research is required to fully understand um, the nature of, of a background assemblage or um, event level response in the nanoplankton. So whether something is really happening um, or we just don't know that it's different because we have no general um, background understanding of what the assemblage looks like. And so um, the combination of the expanded stratigraphy, the exceptional microfossil preservation, um, really helped us to generate um, an incredibly long 23 million year high fidelity nanoplankton assemblage record, which looked something like this. And so I've got um, age is actually interestingly going. So we've got the youngest up here at the top and oldest material at the bottom. And this is just a percentage graph showing you a stacked graph showing you the different um, proportion of uh, family groups. So um, oh, it says genus, but it means family groups. <laughs> and uh, I think it's quite clear that you can see what is colored in gray here is the Nola rebdaceae, which was all the little ones that were in light blue in the um, in the figure a little bit before. And so um, these were the most dominant uh, family. So this includes reticulofenestra and cyclocargolithus gene uh, genera. Um, and they're comprising in general about 80% of the population um, throughout the record. And so um, only eight different species comprised 88% of the record. Um, and so even though we have a really diverse assemblage, the dominance of a couple of um, attacks were really noticeable. And so um, we also know that the global species richness, which is shown here on the column on the far right, um, again, oldest material at the bottom and younger at the top, um, we know that the species richness is steadily declining um, from the Middle Eocene um, through to the uh, Oligocene, and this is in purple, the general, um, the global climate record is in purple. Um, and so we have the highest diversity um, in the long-term record um, here in the Eocene, after the um, Middle Eocene climatic optimum and a really short interval of um, intense warming. Um, for in the air scene. And um, so some intervals are indicating, especially here and slightly here. So the yellow is the record from um, our record, is the nanoplankton diversity from our record. And you can see in some places a little bit higher than the global diversity record. And we attribute that to um, the fact that we have uh, some new tax that we've identified and also just the sheer um, I guess that demonstrates the, the quality of the of the nanofossil record. Um, and some of these taxa, um, there are 
between when uh, this the purple record was published and when I have our yellow record, there's a couple of new species not from our record, um, not just from our record have been named. So um, there is a little bit of um, explanation for this uh, difference. Um, so from the onset of the Middle e Middle Eocene glacial interval, which is highlighted here, the Mog Moggy, um, through to the Lower Miocene, species richness is consistently high, but the general trends are essentially following the same. So what we're seeing as climate is cooling, um, nanofactor nano assemblages are sensitive and they're responding, and they are um, diversity is broadly tracking these changes um, through time. There we go. So um, the Oligocene is marking also the evolution of uh, modern ocean circulation. So that's through the development of um, the thermohaline circulation. So as um, as where that's where deep water is formed and where it, the where a new stuff is coming up at the top. And so um, this coupled with the climate changes that we have um, that we know of. Um, are, have a huge effect on, on the waters and the surface waters where um, the nanoplankton communities are living. So these oceanic and climatic reorganization, or this reorganization, sort of facilitated the evolution of several important components of the modern communities, modern nanoplankton communities um, in the late Oligocene. So uh, this graph, is, these series of graphs are showing you some of the, um, some of the key gen uh, genus uh, genera rather, um, from the study interval. And you can see um, that these groups are sort of evolved, these, this up here, these are the modern groups that are evolving. And you can see the decline in some of the paleogene or the um, earlier paleogene um, uh, groups uh, as you're coming into this major interval of cooling. So the blue bands in these graphs are showing intervals of cooling and the red is something that's a bit warmer. So um, the evolving groups are joining the dominant um, groups to form the basis of what modern, so these ones here, are what modern nanoplankton communities look like. So it's interesting that this is happening um, in the late Oligocene. So the timing of these emerging community groups is also significant. So not just that they're, ha that they're emerging here, um, but that there is this big sort of gap between when we're, we're losing some and when after the around the Eocene Oligocene uh, transition and when we when we have these uh, new uh, groups becoming more dominant um, and so there are other studies that suggest that I can show you highlighted here so there's some suggest studies that suggest the timing of this um, delay which is about 10 million years um, it's actually really significant and it shows that between major extinctions and the time it takes for these species to adapt and to develop really innovative and new life strategies um, in ecospaces that they weren't previously um, living in. So essentially, while the diversification of a, of a, of a group will start immediately, the full, um, what we refer to as full post extinction diversification takes time. So while we've lost many taxa, um, it takes time for them to rebuild. And this period of time is usually about 10 million years. And so this delay or hysteresis is present in all major plankton groups across the many mass extinctions in Earth's history. So um, we see it at the um, KPG boundary and in other times as well. And it has a technical term, technical, it has a term used, um, it's called the macro evolutionary speed limit. So this sort of has been imposed on the nanoplankton assemblages following many species of extinction at the Eastern Oligocene transition. Because as I mentioned earlier, nanoplankton are generally warm water tax, so they prefer warmer waters. So as we, as climate changed at the Eocene and we lost um, we had ice, it, it got much cooler, we lost a lot of taxa at that time. And so we're still looking, I'm still working to determine some of these main drivers of the, level, of the, of the evolution, and um, this is still some ongoing work. So I don't have quite all the answers yet, but um, it's just an interesting um, thing to have noticed. And so from identifying these emerging groups, we also felt it was important to consider the long-term variability of the assemblages. And this is similar to what a colleague um, 
has done uh, for the early paleogene. So this, this record is looking at 66 million years. So this is the um, very early Paleocene. So the, immediately after um, the Cretaceous Paleogene um, mass extinction and the bolide impact. And we have 61 million years up here. So it's a short interval of time. Um, and they were looking at something similar. So they were, as I've mentioned before, um, nanoplankton research is generally focused on these extreme short-term events. So we're looking at the Eocene, Oligocene transition or something in the um, Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. So these are really short-lived transient global warming events or cooling events. Um, but uh, to have to assess the impact of the events in context, it's really important that we have like a comparable understanding of what their background states is versus their variability. And so this is what this, this study tried to do. Um, looking at the post KPG oceans, KPG being Cretaceous Paleogene, um, where this early time interval was really dominated by, um, characterized by exceptionally high rates of variability. So. I mentioned earlier that 90% um, of nanoplankton species were lost at the KPG boundary. This is really significant. Um, and so these assemblages, even post extinction, were really variable. Um, and so to do this, we to try and um, apply or try and get an understanding of, of, of how to measure this um, variability, the, we use statistical analysis um, and it's the the tool is or the there is is um the sum some standard deviation which essentially is quantifying the level of variance across multiple taxa and provide uh, providing a measure of community variability so with low values representing stability this is what's highlighted in green here so lower values is something quite stable and then the higher values is is un, is very high highly variable um, assemblages. So you can see through the first um, 2 million years here that it's very variable and then it sort of settles down again um, through the later Paleocene. And so we wanted to do this um, for our record in the lower as the lower Paleogene sort of provides a benchmark of nanoplankton community variants. And we can use this to compare other time intervals. And so um, we were actually able to integrate um, our records from the North Atlantic um, with the records here from um, the KPG and additional data from the Eocene that we have from a colleague. And this offers an unprecedented um, opportunity to examine and compare the quantitative high resolution pale paleontological data over an interval of um, 44 million years, which is quite a significant amount of time. So I'll just take you back one step, and this is what our data looked like before we were, um, as we were trying to do it. So, and to, to try and apply the um, statistical analysis. So what we needed to do um, to, to ensure there was maximum compar comparability through the data set was um, we focused on a set of taxa that ranged through the entire interval. And so even though we had um, some taxa that went extinct in the middle, um, there was enough long ranging taxa um, that were abundant enough within the community. So we also um, calculated the standard deviation uh, for each taxon um, in 250,000 year windows, and then the summed coefficient of variation was calculated, um, which is this line here in the gray. So in the all these multiple colors are the individual um, taxon group, taxa groups that we were calculating. And so these were long ranging throughout the um, throughout the interval. And the gray is the summed um, coefficient of variability. And because we were some because the sample resolution um, and the data collection methods were complementary for each of the studies. So for this work and for the um, the paper that I showed you just before, um, we were able to compare from um, this study with the earlier record. And this is what it looked like. So it's highlighted here in green. And um, we have time again on the uh, y-axis. So this is the earliest, er earliest Paleogene or the Paleocene. And we have just here into the Miocene or into the Neogene. And what you can see is a range of 
um, using some CV and a range of different diversity and community metrics, um, we were able to um, look at objectively look at uh, measuring the long term history of diversity, uh, community stability and essentially the resilience and, and comparability of background um, variability versus event level change. So uh, for the first 44 million years of the Cenozoic um, and unfortunately there is a gap here. Um, in the air scene of about um, 8 million years, um, but we can still get a really good understanding of what is going on. And so what we found was that um, looking at this inset here, the background slope of variability, this changed interestingly at the same, the, the um, angle, yeah, the angle of slope changed at the same time with the same values. And so we use this to infer um, that this was a level of um, background variability and that it was actually similar, although there was such high variability in the earliest um, paleogene, uh, the background level appeared to remain the same um, throughout this interval of time. And so anything that sort of that's what we've shaded in purple here and anything above this line is what we deem to be above background. Um, and so this is sort of a consistent feature. Um, through the nanoplankton assemblages. And it relates to things like the, these are major climatic events. So the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, this is what's popping out here. The Eocene, Oligocene transition. Um, this mid Oligocene glacial interval, which is a period within the Oligocene where we first have, um, we have some, not first, there are just an, an extreme um, glacial interglacial cycles that are first being recorded. Um, and interestingly, there's, little, um, there isn't any change at the Oligocene-Miocene transition, which I had expected there to be. Um, and so it's important to point out that despite the very significant diversity loss in nanoplankton across this time interval, um, what we understand is that there is actually a background state that's maintained um, throughout most of the early Cenozoic. So to conclude, um, our research was trying to document long-term high-resolution nanoplankton records um, and nanoplankton assemblage and composition records for a relatively understudied oligocene interval. Um, and the resolution and the length of this um, is really uh, unique, um, allowing for long-term variability and assemblages throughout the paleogene to be observed. Um, and we really highlight the resilience of plankton um, to climatic and environmental um, perturbations. So our nanoplankton assemblages were recorded throughout the study interval, um, highly diverse nanoplankton assemblages, and this unusual um, diversity recovered from the deep sea settings provides us with high quality estimates of diversity, including forms that were not previously recorded um, in open ocean settings. And these assemblages reflect the global trends of, of long-term climate, um, long-term decline in, in species diversity um, from the Eocene with community shifts sort of reflecting the response to decreasing temperatures um, and increasing nutrients throughout the interval. Um, and finally, we had sort of the background variability, which remained relatively stable throughout the interval, despite quite pervasive diversity loss in nanoplankton through this time. And then just to finish, I wanted to take it back to try and explain a little bit about how we can use um, this kind of research to better inform our understanding of, of future climate change. So, you know, the, the past is the key to the future. So the better we understand what's going on in the past, um, we can apply it to the future. And, when, and what we and whoever comes behind us might experience or how they can adapt. And so the first way we can do this is um, by trying to compare culture studies with assemblage and geochemical data. Um, so where cultures attempt to replicate past climate conditions and the behavior of nanoplankton when certain variables might be adjusted um, and then monitored. So for example, if you increase in, an, in a culture, you increase the amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide in the, in, in, in the environment there. Um, this, this can help us and sort of understand what, what might happen to these assemblages in the future. Although the data can produce 
some conflicting results. <laughs> I'm not um, an expert in this. Um, and alternatively, data such as this can be included in modeling. Um, so the Oligocene has somewhat similar climate to today, albeit we're warming now much faster than we have ever in the past. Um, but our understanding of how nanoplankton responded in an Oligocene world might help us to explain the possible response of um, plankton in the coming years. And so similarly, this data can be used to model past ocean currents um, and bathymetry. And that's something that we're trying to look at um, in my research in the future is, is um, with the material that we've covered from the South Atlantic, um, how this has changed. So yeah, and um, I will finish there with a nice photo of um, Laura and I at the back on the heli deck um, of the Joyous Resolution watching a sunset probably I think on our way back to um to Cape Town so um just a thanks to the London NERC doctoral training partnership who funded my PhD Paul Bowne and Jeremy Young my supervisors um Terry Newsom who helped to produce this record and um Sam Gibbs who helped with some of the analysis so thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer questions as best I can I can also turn my camera back on. I hope. Dr. Rattledge, thanks so much for all of that. I felt like I was virtually trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle as you were <laughs> explaining and just really how these deep sea sediment core records are so key in putting together the pieces of this puzzle and really trying to understand not just past Earth's climate, but also, as you said, how we can apply that to the future. So. Um, Thank you again for all of that. I want to encourage people to put any additional questions you may have in the chat. And we did have a couple of questions that came in on the registration form as well. So I will uh, actually, I think I'll start with one of the questions that's in the chat. Do you ever add dye to your samples to make it easier to see or count the nanofossils? Uh, no, actually, no, we don't. Um, I think it would be too hard to do that um, because, yeah, because they're so small, um, it's really hard to isolate individual um, species on a, on a sample. It might be possible if you're looking at them um, in a culture sample or something like that, but just for our samples, no, any color that's added to um, images is done post-production <laughs> and that sometimes helps us to look at um, the different co individual coccoliths or coccospheres and try and identify species that way but no we haven't um I've not tried it with the uh with dyeing them but I'm sure there'd be some actually it could be kind of fun I don't think it would be possible just with the size of them though thank you for that uh, one of the questions that came in ahead of time and uh, this is I think a broader picture question here how much does ocean acidification impact plankton and fossils? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it has a huge impact on 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 um, on the on the on the plankton, um, and it's something that a lot of people are looking at now because with um, increasing, so nanoplankton obviously have a large um, role to play in the carbon cycle, um, and that's sequestering. Well, yeah. As, as, an, as a carbon sink in the ocean for uh, drawing it down, but that also has ramifications for things like ocean acidification, so where um, we're losing it. And yeah, they, um, I don't know that I have a great answer, but I know that it's, <laughs> sorry, but I know that it's really, yeah, they, they, ocean acidification um, really does play a factor in, 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 in the nanoplankton assemblages and, and um, preservation. Speaking of preservation, I was thinking back to my own PhD research at University of Miami, and I worked with continuous cores that were collected on land, so mm -hmm. on the Florida Keys and Everglades National Park, and I was looking at plaintic foraminifera and identifying those. And is there an advantage or disadvantage to looking at cores drilled on land that go back in geologic time to cores drilled in the ocean? Uh, I would say the main difference is the exposure. So sediments from land are um, sort of more available to be weathered, to be affected by things like weathering. And um, uh, also often land sections, it's hard to access the complete record for various different reasons. Um, so ocean sediments are ideal in that you've 
generally are they fairly undisturbed you know once there's something I mean unless there's something down there um they are sort of left free to just consolidate on on, on top of each other so um and less exposed to yeah things like humans and other other climatic factors um seas rising seas all that sort of stuff Another so, question. Yeah, yeah, will have effects on preservation yeah so if you had a choice, you would prefer ocean cores instead of land-based cores. <laughs> yeah, I would, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Another question in the chat. How much do we know about the temperature range of each species? Temperature range each species can survive. Right. Um, so we have a reasonable understanding of, um, by tracking uh individual taxa through time and getting, a, and also looking at sort of their, uh nearest living relative we can get an indication of um things like yeah the past climate i'm not sure if we are able to give exact temperature ranges but we know that some taxa um, are really good indicators of um, cooler climates they they are generally found in in higher latitudes um, but these are also ones that went extinct um as you know um yeah as as climate was changing so that's sort of how we're using these to infer climate and temperature response um but i'm not sure that we there are some uh, other geochemical analyses that help to um better understand exact temperature ranges but i it's not in my wheelhouse i have one last question that came in on the registration forms uh this again is i think a broader one uh, does ocean pollution impact your research of the ocean? Ooh, um, for me personally, I'm looking at things that are um, my um, area of study or my interval of study is, is much older. So at that stage, um, humans don't have a huge influence on um, the assemblages. However, I'm for people that are looking at the plankton, so that's still living in the ocean today, or um, really young material, um, I'm sure that there will be, I'm not sure, I imagine that there will be some kind of, there could be some kind of indication in there, whether that's, um, yeah, just the, just changing, even if it was things like, um, I guess not pollution, but I was thinking about things like, uh, yeah, if, if you're looking at something closer to a river output system um, and humans are upstream of this and then how that's affecting, um, so that could be uh, changing the nutrient levels. Um, and so that will attract and, and deter different different species. So there is a there, there is an influence, um, but look further back in time, it's less about um, human pollution, I would say. And it's interesting because you showed a short video clip where there was a bucket being thrown off the side or lowered, I should say, off the side of <laughs> resolution and you were bringing up current surface water samples. And so, mm -hmm. Might you see some indicators in there, especially being collected so close to a ship? Yeah, possibly. So um, I, yeah, that could be true. I, so from those samples, we took um, measurements like uh, the salinity and the temperature. And so we've got those exact with, at the time we took those. So I wonder if that will have anything to do with the, um, that will have any effect on the assemblage. And once I have a look at those samples, I can let you know. <laughs> If there's anything useful in there, never a shortage of samples, are there? <laughs> no, there's samples everywhere. <laughs> Not with the Very size cool. of our ocean. Yeah. Well, that's all I have seen come in for questions, and so uh, this just has been just fascinating seeing all this amazing detail and how much yet we still have to learn about mm -hmm. our own system, planet Earth, and what's going on in the ocean, and uh, what it can still tell us about the future. So. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Jeremia for some closing comments. Yeah, we'll just be very succinct. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming this this evening. I'd like to thank Dr. Claire Rutledge for presenting from Germany uh, very late in her time, and you know, sort of a first for the institute to have an international scientist uh, beam in to our membership and audience. So thank you very much. Um, so just want to thank you one last time, and have a great night, everybody.